self-evident today that Nigeria is in a precarious state. Nigeria is in a dear situation. Nigeria is in a life support. And when you have a patient in a life support, you don't require general physicians. You require specialists, people with different expertise. So the situation we have or we are faced with in Nigeria today, it is clear that our vocational politicians cannot provide the answer. That's why I'm offering myself with wide range of expertise as a futurist, as a tax expert, as a financial expert, as a leadership expert, as a forensic expert, and as a development economics. And with all sense of responsibility and modesty, I want to announce to Nigerians that I have the solution to the present leadership quandary we are faced with in Nigeria. And as president, I'm not going to engage in guesswork. That's why my promissory note to Nigerians is smart government. Smart government is not an acronym. Smart government is not a campaign slogan, just the way integrity has become a campaign slogan. Smart government is a research and tested model. The model that built China, that is the current most productive nation in the world, and has become the bank of last resort to many nations, including Nigeria. Smart government is that model that built South Korea, which is the most innovative nation in the world today. Smart government is the model that built Dubai, that has become the choice destination for many tourists in the world today. Smart government is the model that built Singapore, a nation with no resor natural resources, but has become the, one of the most competitive and prosperous nations. So I am offering Nigerians smart government to achieve two things. The first is to shape what we call the Nigerian dream. That is, a nation that offers a citizen a promise. What makes a nation unique and worth dying for? You ask yourself today, you that is watching me, what promise is this social system called Nigeria offering you as a citizen of this nation? As a citizen of this nation, will you be happy or will you allow your father, your husband, your brother, or your sister to be in any of the security services today, given the kind of calamity that we've faced in the recent past weeks. And I am coming to tell Nigerians, or to offer Nigerians, that nation, that secure nation, a nation that offers a promise to our citizens. And the second thing I want to achieve is to get all Nigerians right progressively in the path way of prosperity. So smart government is that preferred future that has eluded Nigerians for the past 58 years. And all nations, or nations that have not risen to embrace smart government have been left in the dark of underdevelopment. And like Nigeria, we are now being trapped in a morass of a failed state with the highest impoverished citizens. We are being ravaged by insecurity. And corruption is growing exponentially. We are faced with a future of hopelessness and despair. So I am offering Nigerian smart government. And I must say that smart government is not just an agenda. 
but a model that Nigerians must adopt and generally follow through. So the processes, which I said there are five unimpeachable steps that Nigeria must follow. The first one is to have what is called the article of faith. The article of faith is what defines the promise that a nation offers to a citizen. The article of faith is what makes a nation unique and worth dying for. The article of faith is what defines the dreams, the vision of a nation. The article of faith is what defines the shared values that different tongues, tribes, clan and creed have agreed to live together. So that is the first step. And all great and prosperous nations espouse seven virtues that underscore their sustainability in terms of their prosperity. So the first thing I'm going to be offering Nigerians within the first 60 days in office is to organize what is called a Truth and Reconciliation Summit where I need to bring all the ethnic groups together. And what we shall be discussing is not about resource control or uh, sharing of a national cake. Rather, the virtues that make nations great. That is what we are going to be discussing. And that's why I said, I am running for this office to liberate Nigerians from the siege of ignorance. Because Nigeria today, we are trapped in this endless cycle of failure on account of ignorance. So we need to liberate ourselves by adopting the best practice in the world, the value system that we guarantee the unity, progress, and prosperity of all Nigerians. Mm -hmm. That is what the article of faith offers. Okay, you, you're going to be talking about the other four um, <coughs> articles of your creed, as you put it. Now, are, are, are these personal convictions or is this the philosophical background on which the liberation movement, your political party, is built? Yes. It, my, 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 uh, the liberation party believes that Nigeria today requires three things. To liberate all Nigerians or to offer Nigerians social freedom, economic freedom, and political freedom. And they are all in tandem with the smart government model. The smart government model is a model that has been researched and is all over the world. And I've mentioned nations that adopt the smart government model. So the second component of the smart government model is what I call is the rule of law. Now, the rule of law is fueled by the shared values that have been accepted or agreed upon by the people of the nation. So that forms the basis for drafting the new constitution. And we are, we are telling Nigerians that by December 15th of this year, we are going to be offering Nigerians the people's constitution. We believe that Nigerians must have a constitution that they call their own. A constitution that any government that comes to power must know that the people are the ultimate owners of the power and resources of this nation. The people are the master of government. That is the kind of constitution we'll be giving Nigerians the opportunity to form for themselves. That is the second step in the smart government model. model. So the third step is what we call economic freedom. Now, economic freedom, you have about five other components. The first one is policy congruity. In Nigeria today, policies and government practice have become a burden on its own because there is no alignment between the fiscal and the monetary policies. And when policies are conflicting, what you have is a slow growth in economy. 
you have high unemployment, you have high inflation, which also translates to what? High poverty. So the issue we are having in the economy is we need to have policy alignment. So within the first 90 days, I'm going to be organizing a Fusca and Monetary Policy Summit where we are going to be defining the vision and the policy framework for each industry and sector in this nation. So that when a policy is offered or is issued, it will not be contradicting a policy in another sector or industry. So what we should be asking ourselves is what is actually the business of government. So we are going to be looking at policy regarding energy because energy is a problem in this country. We look at policy in terms of tourism, policy in terms of talent management. We have a, a pool of talents in, in Nigeria, but there is no policy that is actually harnessing these talents. Then we look at policy centered around learning and innovation. Our school system is nothing to write home about. That's why we are not productive. So we need to have concise, defined policies that will address this issue, that will make our people have marketable skills that are fit for industry. Then we look at the uh, uh, automobile industry. People have been selling used cars for how many years? What stops us from start producing our own cars? So we need to develop a policy that will make this used car seller so actually start owning assembly plants and it's only the government that can put that bring such policy framework to help these people we need to look at policy on our infrastructure development the current government are making a, a whole lot of noise about infrastructure you ask yourself a question this infrastructure they are building are they fit for purpose are this infrastructure going to be relevant in the next 10 to 15 years, my generation is saying, no, these are not the kind of infrastructure we need now. So as president of this nation, we are going to be putting, we we'll establish infrastructures policy that will be futuristic, that will be 15 years, that will be fit for purpose. Not just a situation whereby you draw up a budget for the purpose of constructing one or two roads. That is not what my generation once. Then the next thing in the economic freedom, we are going to be looking at the capital market. The capital market is vital for every thriving economy. In Nigeria today, with over a population of one, uh, 190 million, we have just about 44 companies active in the capital market. The capital market provides long-term funds for companies so that they can grow their business men can grow their businesses and expand and when businesses expand you employ more people now we are going to be bringing introducing innovative and smart policies that will see over a thousand to two thousand companies active in that uh, capital market so that they can raise long-term funds then the third component in the economic freedom is the financial service industry. What we have today in Nigeria is a financial service that is an end to itself. A financial service is supposed to be a means, that's why it's called financial service, to service other sector of the economy. In Nigeria today, you discover that the banks are posting huge profit while the businesses in other sectors are what? Are folding up which is a misnomer. So we need to bring innovative poli uh, uh, policies to reposition the financial service industry so that they can do what exactly they are meant to be doing. Then the next steps. So one of the things I'm going to be introducing. Which will be, which will be the fifth no, this, step of freedom. I'm only, I'm yes. I'm, for, let me stick. Um, one of the fundamental issues that we must address in our financial service industry is the interest rate. No nation can build capital with the kind of interest regime that we have. So 
I am going to be driving the interest rate to 7%. Then the next From the almost 30% that it is to right? Yes, to 7%. Now, the next step is property rights. We need to look at the laws governing our property rights. There should be ease of acquiring property and transferring of property, which we don't have in Nigeria. And if we really want to build capital in Nigeria, then we must review those laws. Then the last thing in economic freedom is entrepreneurial development. Now I'm going to be setting up a ministry called the Ministry of Entrepreneurial Development. And this ministry, the KPI for this ministry will be to provide legal services, management services, accounting services, and financial support to SMEs. So we are looking at, in the next four years of my administration, to build viable one million SMEs in Nigeria which amounts to 250 SMEs per year. And these SMEs, we must make sure that they have, they employ minimum of five people in these SMEs. And when you put that together, that gives you five million jobs. So what are the things I'm going to be doing? I'm going to build a task code to support this SME project. So I'm going to be building a task code which is called Entrepreneurial Development Tax Reliefs. So for people who try to support SMEs, like the business angels, then they will be entitled to Entrepreneurial Development Relief. These are some of the things that we are going to be introducing. These are some of the policies that we are going to be introducing to drive SME development in, in Nigeria. Okay. Then you talk about the fourth step in the smart government model it is a fair tax system taxation in nigeria today is all about fundraising instead of being a catalyst for prosperity that is taxation is a fiscal tool that we are supposed to use to diversify this economy from this mono economy to different sources of uh, income uh, for this, uh, our, our nation. Now, three things that I'm going to be doing to change taxation in Nigeria. One is smart and innovative policy. That is, our tax system has to be what? Strategic in nature. Strategic in terms of Supporting business growth, not just collecting tax revenue from them. Two, industrialization. So I, we are going to be developing policies that promote industrialization. Then three, infrastructural development. We develop tax policies that will promote infrastructural development. Then four, human capital development. So we, have, we are going to be having a tax system that will ensure that people put their children in school, that will ensure that people have access to medical insurance, that will ensure that people have means of owning their homes. That is the only way you can promote or encourage people to pay taxes. Not this current way that we've seen, that has become a huge burden on individuals and companies. Then the second thing that I'm going to be introducing in uh, making the tax system to be fair in Nigeria is to review the current policies and laws. The current policies is, and laws are likened to preparing students with a wrong syllabus. And what will be the outcome? The student will surely fail. Do you know that the VAT law we are operating in Nigeria today is over 25 years old? It's currently 25 years old. The income tax law that we are operating is over 30 years old because the current framework we are using now is from 1990. 
And how do you expect to use the laws that are 30 years old to operate in this economy? So our laws are not reflecting the e current economic realities. That's why we are struggling. That's why you see people shout that they are not paying taxes. The issue is you don't have the correct laws in the first place. So we need to change those laws. Make sure that we have laws that are up to date that will not be burden to taxpayers. Okay. So we are expecting that by the time we introduce these laws, our revenue generation is going to move from this current 5.6% uh, um, to our GDP to 25%. This is a model, a paper I've actually developed for the African Development Bank as far as 2012, but which was not adopted in Nigeria. We are then not the next collecting thing, enough taxes. We are not collecting enough taxes. And the reason is because of our tax laws. So we need to have innovative tax policies and laws that we encourage businesses to blossom and pay huge taxes to government. So the next thing that we must do or that is making our taxes collection to be low is that we have multiple taxations and in some cases double taxations. In Nigeria today we have about 62 approved taxes and levies and several unapproved levies that you see states, governments and local governments are collecting. You don't grow an economy. When you have such policies, no economy can prosper. And when you look at the OECD model for a fair tax system, it's very clear. Try as much as possible to have a tax system that is one tax per a tax base. But what we have, we have one tax by multiple tax base in Nigeria. That's why we are, we are struggling. So we need to change all that. And these are some of the things I will be introducing as president. Okay. Now I'm saying this because uh, other people will be waiting for someone else to come and advise them. But I have these skills. And that's why I'm saying I am the best candidate as we speak today because I have the solutions to the problems and the challenges that this nation face. All right, we have with us Dr. Chris David, who is a presidential candidate of the Freedom Movement. Liberation, Liberation Movement. Liberation Movement, I beg your pardon. Liberation Movement. And, of course, he's been very passionate in outlining the five pillars of his political party and his idea of what government will be. Uh, we'll take a short break, and when we return, we will be talking a lot more about his party manifesto and his ideas of achieving all of those things that this party is promising. Stay with us. Fresh season of electioneering in Nigeria. Politics is thick in the air. The political gladiators are back on the soapbox with numerous campaign promises. But what are the plans to implement their policy documents? This is the big question for the candidates. Africa Independent Television, AIT, hosts all the party standard bearers in the 2019 presidential election on a Know Your Right Candidates program. Face the nation every day of the week. The presidential candidates in an alphabetical order will feature on the program from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Face the nation, defining issues. Thank you so much for staying with us, Dr. Chris David. Uh, he is the presidential candidate of the liberation movement, one of the political parties that uh, is uh, gunning for the presidency of Nigeria in the February 6 uh, presidential election. And of course, he's been trying to outline what his party's program will be when he gets to government. He has mentioned four of the five pillars. Well, we'll be talking more now about the fifth one before we start firing the questions from this end, because there are other specific areas. 
even though your five pillars seem to cover almost everything, but there are some other gray areas yeah. that we need to talk about. The fifth step is what I call the learning economy. Learning is the foundation for productivity. So that means that we need to look at our educational system. The current educational system, is it fit for purpose? The graduates that we are producing today, do they have the right skills to fit into the various industries? The answer is no. And that's why we have high rate of unemployment because what we are actually producing in Nigeria are waste. We are pro producing unemployable people that are not fit into industries. That's why you discover that somebody will go to school after four or five years, you will say he wants to, he, after four or five years, that he wants to learn computer. So what have you been doing in school? So it's not enough to just say that we are not funding education. The question is that the current education system we have, is it fit for purpose? So until we address <coughs> that, we'll keep on having issues with productivity. That's why we are not being able to transform our raw materials into finished goods. So learning economy actually position a nation to move from what we currently have is a poverty alleviation model to a wet creation model. A wet creation model is the model that ensures that people, citizens, have the right knowledge and skills to be able to convert raw materials into finished goods. So we look at the development. For instance, the agricultural sector that we've been shouting about. This current government has made so much noise about agriculture. But if you go into the website of food and agricultural organization today, Nigeria is listed as one of the 37 countries that requires external food assistance. You can check the website as I'm speaking. So that means the claim by this government is just for campaign purposes. So the learning economy will enable us to develop the agricultural value chain. We need to position Nigeria in such a way that we will not be exporting raw material, but the ability to transform this agricultural produce from one stage to the other. And until we are able to do that, we will not be able to create employment for our people. Our people will keep on, will remain poor because our uh, per capita income will still remain um, uh, small. So first thing we need to do, we need to redesign the educational system to be fit for purpose. Then we look at the transformation of other natural resources. We call ourselves giant of Africa, oil producing nation. And we cannot even refine our product. We need to change that. So that by the time we produce our crude, we refine everything in Nigeria for the consumption of our citizen. Until we are able to do that, we will keep on battling with exchange rates. We keep on fighting to devalue uh, neras. We keep on fighting with inflation rate because these are externalities that we don't have control over. So the smart government model, which is what China is operating at, has made it to be one of the most productive nations, is that you must equip your people, your human capital, with the right knowledge and skills so that they can become productive in various industries. And until Nigeria attains that level, then we will keep on borrowing from China and other nations. So the learning economy is to position Nigeria to be self-sufficient, that we are going to be producing 
what we need to eat in Nigeria. And innovative policies are the things that we need to introduce to make sure that our people, we, up, we constantly upgrade their skills to be able to meet up with the high demands of technology. So there are several areas that the learning economy covers. I talked about talent management. Look at pool of Nigerian youths, diverse talent. Who is managing them? Mm. Look at the sports industry. Take sports, for instance. You can develop sports. We develop sports in such a way that the EPL that everybody is looking at, we domesticate the same thing in Nigeria in such a way that those nations will look to Nigeria in obtaining to get their, their, the, the, the players they need. So smart policies are the things you need to bring in place. So okay. one of the things you need to do is to take sports from government. Okay. Okay. Chris, let, let's... Uh, Let's ask the questions now so that you can respond to a number of them because we already have people who are watching and who are tweeting in and want to know a lot more about the details of some of the things you have espoused. Philip? Yeah, uh, Dr. David, uh, the smart uh, government model seems uh, very attractive. You know, you spoke eloquently about it. My worry is that the nations you have mentioned, China, Singapore, UAE, they are different from Nigeria. Nigeria is a different kind of country, different environment and area. I'm beginning to wonder how you are going to implement that here, to use it to transform our economy. Of course, we are a futurist. You are also a developmental economist. But how would that model work in Nigeria? you know, with what we have here in Nigeria. We have tried different models in the last 19 years. And some of the elements you've mentioned, you know, in the smart model have also been tried as part of some of these uh, policies successive governments have implemented in this country. How are you going to make this work in Nigeria? In other words, your smart model for us is largely dependent on technology. Now, with a country that is, at this point in time, very deficient technologically, how are you going to go about that? Okay, let me take the, the first question. I will say uh, in one breath that Nigeria is not different from those nations. The only difference is our value system. So that's why I start with the article of faith, which addresses the value system of a nation. So that is where we are lacking. That is the foundation. Until we get that foundation right, then your economic policies, your anti-corruption crusade, and whatever thing you are bringing will never stand. Because if the foundation of a nation is faulty, then nothing works. What you experience is complete system failure and the pervasive graft that we have. So what we need to address, the first thing we need to do is to address the value systems. And I said there are seven virtues which you will see in those nations that I know in Nigeria. i give you an ex example. The China that we are running to go and borrow money, do you know the first 12 institutions or companies in China are government controlled. In Nigeria, the NMPC, look at the way we are running it, is because of our value system. So that is my starting point. And that's why I said, within the first 30 days, we need to address this issue. We need to tell ourselves this undeniable truth that everybody must be aware of. And I'm going to be creating a ministry of value transformation so that mm. these values or these seven virtues can be entrenched in all the sectors of the economy. And you talk about smart government being driven by technology. That is partly correct. But largely is by innovative policies. 
without having innovative policies, then you're, you will not even know the right technology to use. So the smart government is a product of leadership foresight that engages system thinking. What we have in Nigeria is linear thinking. So engages systems thinking. You think the system holistically. And that's why I also talk about policy conflicting themselves. So when you engage in systems thinking, what you achieve is that you address the challenges from their roots so that you will not have conflicting or counterproductive results. That is what smart government is all about. And that is what I'm promising Nigerians. That is what is working in Dubai. That is what is working in China. That is what is working in Switzerland. That is what is working in South Korea. That South Korea is the most innovative nation of the world today. Yeah, you, you talked about the value system. And I still want to take you on that. For example, corruption. You say we have to handle it from the roots. From? from the roots. How are you going to handle this? You see, different governments, for example, in the last 19 years, starting from President Lushegun Obasanjo, who actually sets up the EFCC and the ICPC, have been trying to tackle this monster. But the more we try, the more it gets out of hand. How will you handle it? How are you going to attack this so that you'll be able to implement these policies you have on the table? He, he spoke, you have spoken about mm -hmm. the value reorientation, a value system. How critical is that to the fight against corruption? Well, the reason why the fight against corruption or the anti-corruption crusade has not been successful is because successful government, including this government, don't actually know what corruption is. It is self-evident that despite the seemingly bold fight against corruption, Corruption is still growing exponentially in this current administration. And I may both to say that it is not dangerous to fight corruption. It is dangerous and deadly when you use the wrong technique. And if you have gone through my profile, you will see my model, which I call corruption-free society model. That is a product, having research, the top least corrupt nations. So you fight corruption with a defined methodology and techniques, not with bricks and mortar, because that is what we are doing. And that is what has made Niger the, the lives of Nigerians miserable, including the lives of people fighting corruption. So, corruption has spirit, soul, and body. And the fight against corruption cannot be successful until you engage these three dimensions. So, what is the spirit of, gov of corruption? The spirit of corruption lies within the value system. So if the value system of a nation is wrong, then no matter what you do, you cannot, it will be likened to cutting the trees, the branches of a tree, which in few months or few weeks, the tree will grow back. So you need to uproot it. So the first thing to do is addressing the value system. Mm. How long? So do you I'm do? going to, I'm going to be leading a moral revolution. That's why I said that I'm going to be setting up a ministry of values transformation to drive these values across the social systems. When I say social system, I talked about the family system, the traditional institution system, the religious is, uh, system the learning system, the lifestyle system, 
the public institution system, the private organization system. So you drive the value system, giving those seven virtues, you make sure that it is entrenched and it becomes a song that everybody is singing, just like today, how songs trend, different songs trend. That is how you make the value system to trend. Okay. So it now becomes part and parcel of the lifestyle of people. Dr. David, how long do you think, think it will take to drive that value system into the minds and souls of Nigerians, especially people who have been used to the old ways of doing things? Well, I said within the first 30 days, I'm going to organize that Truth and Reconciliation Summit. And what we are going to be discussing is this value system. Now, by the time you establish it and you now have the ministry, which is now going to be driving it, then, like they say, when people keep on hearing one thing after the other, then the change will come. Now, it will not be that it is government that is now fighting. It is now the people because they know that once we embrace these virtues, these are the benefits that will accrue to all. So the first step to fighting this monster called corruption is addressing it with the value system. Then the second aspect, which is the soul, is to look at the social system. And there are seven components that you must go through in the soul. So it's a detailed work. That's why I said what I'm offering Nigerians is not these slogans and, and four points agenda. It's, it's a detail, a model. Mm. What is obtainable in these nations that we all want to run to? So it's a model. Two, okay. three hours will not be enough for me to espouse this thing. So you look at uh, uh, this. And, <laughs> and we, we, have, we have run almost one hour. And we have only one hour to go home. I mean, uh, one you, hour. I, I have not even talked, so talked really, about it, it, yeah, you, you, you know, because Nigerians, most times they will tell you uh, it's theory. You it's know, not people theory. People are hungry. There's yes. poverty. Yes. They want to see practical. Yes. Right. And now, that's, that is the soul. Yeah, that's the soul. Yeah, it's in the soul. I'll address it in the soul. Now there's hunger in the land. Yes. You know, that's, that's the message everywhere you yes. go. Yes. How will you tackle that, you know, before you go into this uh, idea of uh, 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 transforming? The, uh, the question you should ask is that why do we have hunger in the land? The answer is because of inequality. So you address inequality as a value. In fact, inequality is the virus that is corrupting the operating system in Nigeria. So you address inequality. We are talking about minimum wage. The, the issue is not minimum wage. The problem we should be tackling is actually the inequality in the reward system. So you, when you tackle it from that angle, that is when you can have lasting solution. But with this present situation, then people will remain hungry and will have insecurity and all the challenges we have. Okay, Doc, uh, Dr. David, you have touched on, on almost every uh, domestic issue in Nigeria today. We, we, with the very little time we have left, what do you uh, propose as your foreign policy pattern? How is it different from what we have today? Well, what I have to say about that is that charity begins at home. How are we treating ourselves as Nigerians in the first place? Can you look at the, the rule of law, how we have messed everything up? If we can debase ourselves, then is it foreign current, current, uh, foreigners that will give us that dignity? We have to treat ourselves as humans with respect for one another. Then that is the only way that you gain respect from 
foreign countries. That is the only way you will be able to sign foreign treaties that you can say you put Nigeria first. But if we don't even respect ourselves, we don't treat ourselves with dignity, then you will have our leaders going out of this country to sign shabby treaties. And I mentioned it, that the peace accord that people signed, they never read those papers because I was one of the people that did not sign because I will never sign a document that I have not read. That is how we, our, our past leaders... Was it not made available to you to read before you signed? That's what I'm saying. You, the, the, the agreement we had was the document should be sent to us, a vital document should be sent to you. You, you read and make comments where you don't agree with. You say, I don't agree with this. Then you correct before you sign. You cannot coerce people two months to election to come and be signing peace accord. When for the past four years, nobody is living in peace in Nigeria. So these are the things we are talking about. So my generation is saying that we must have a departure from the old ways. And I am telling Nigerians that I am the voice of liberation, the face of the new Nigeria, and the preferred future. Thank you so much. Dr. Chris David is the presidential candidate of the liberation movement. That is, is a political party. On that platform, he uh, hopes and intends to become president of Nigeria come February 16, 2019. And, of course, he has presented before Nigerians what he intends to do and the timelines for doing some of those things when he assumes office on May 29, 2019. Dr. Chris Davy, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, and thank you, Nigerians, for listening. Philip Yam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, as as always. Way. Well, that's our program for today. Please join us again next week when we bring you another presidential candidate uh, on face the nation well our intention is to ensure that all the presidential candidates who are standing for election on february 16 uh, take their turns on telling nigerians what their programs are what their blueprint uh, will be for liberating nigeria until then have a wonderful time for the rest of the day bye for now <laughs>